Hello and welcome to the channel. My name is Josh and you're watching Our History. Today we are going over the life of Emily Hobhouse, who was a prominent British welfare campaigner, anti-war activist and pacifist. She is best known for her efforts to improve the appalling conditions in the British concentration camps during the Second World War in South Africa. So if you enjoy this, please be sure to like and if you're new here, consider smashing the subscribe button. If this isn't your first rodeo and you haven't shown some love to the subscribe, now is your opportunity. Thank you for watching. Emily Hobhouse was a prominent British welfare campaigner, anti-war activist and pacifist. Born on April 9, 1860, she is best known for her efforts to improve the appalling conditions of the British concentration camps during the Second Boer War in South Africa. She brought attention to the dire circumstances and worked tirelessly to bring about change. These camps were established to imprison the Boer and African civilians and were characterized by overcrowding, malnutrition and disease. Hobhouse's work shed light on these atrocities and played a crucial role in advocating for better treatment and conditions for the incarcerated civilians. She passed away on the 8th of June 1926. Early Life Emily Hobhouse was born in St. Ive near Liskeard in Cornwall, England. Her parents were Caroline and Reginald Hobhouse. Her father, Reginald, was an Anglican rector and the first archdeacon of Bodmin. Emily had a brother named Leonard Trelawney Hobhouse, who was a renowned peace activist and advocate of social liberalism. Additionally, she was the second cousin of Stephen Henry Hobhouse, another prominent peace activist. Emily's influence on Stephen was significant. Overall, her familial background and connections played a crucial role in shaping her own beliefs and activism in the areas of peace and social liberalism. After the loss of her mother at the age of 20, she dedicated the next 14 years to caring for her ailing father. Following his passing in 1895, she traveled to Minnesota to engage in welfare work among Cornish mine workers. During this time, she became engaged to John Carr Jackson and purchased a ranch in Mexico. Unfortunately, the engagement ended and Emily returned to England in 1898, having suffered financial losses from a speculative venture. Her unworn wedding veil is now displayed at the head office of the Urania Vrouwenvereniging, the women's welfare organization in Bloemfontein, symbolizing her dedication to women's empowerment. Second Boer War When the Second Boer War erupted in South Africa in October 1899, Leonard Courtney, a Liberal MP, extended an invitation to Hobhouse to assume the role of Secretary for the Women's Branch of the South African Conciliation Committee. This committee was under the presidency of Courtney himself. She wrote, It was late in the summer of 1900 that I first learnt of the hundreds of Boer women that became impoverished and were left ragged by our military operations. The poor women who were being driven from pillar to post, needed protection and organized assistance. Emily founded the Distress Fund for South African Women and Children and embarked on a journey to the Cape Colony on the 7th of December 1900. Her purpose was to oversee the distribution of the fund. After a voyage of 20 days, she reached her destination on December the 27th. She later wrote, I am quite naturally in obedience to the feeling of unity or oneness of womanhood. It is when the community is shaking to its foundations that abysmal deaths of privation call to each other and that a deeper unity of humanity evinces itself. Emily's journey to South Africa was initially focused on the concentration camp at Port Elizabeth, but she soon discovered the existence of 45 other concentration camps. Armed with a letter of introduction to the British High Commissioner, Alfred Milner, she was able to secure two railway trucks for her mission pending the approval of Lord Kitchener, the army commander. After a two-week wait, she obtained permission to travel as far as Bloemfontein and transport approximately 12 tons of supplies for the camps. However, her attempt to challenge her detention in South Africa by British authorities through a test case in England in 1900 was ultimately unsuccessful. Conditions in the British concentration camps In 1901, Emily successfully convinced the authorities to allow her to visit several British concentration camps in the Cape and Orange River colonies. She delivered aid and documented the conditions in a report titled Report of a Visit to the Camps of Women and Children. This report, submitted to the British government in June 1901, shed light on the dire situation within the camps. The findings promoted the establishment of a formal commission 
to further investigate the conditions. Led by Millicent Fawcett, a team of official investigators was sent to inspect the camps. The overcrowding, unsanitary conditions, neglect and lack of resources were major contributors to the high mortality rate. Over an 18-month period, a devastating 26,370 lives were lost, approximately 24,000 of those being children under the age of 16 and infants. This tragic figure translates to an alarming average of 50 child deaths per day. The following extracts from the report by Emily Hobhouse make very clear the extent of culpable neglect by the authorities. In some camps, two and even three sets of people occupy one tent and ten and even twelve persons are frequently herded together in tents of which the cubic capacity is about 500 cubic feet. I call this camp system a wholesale cruelty. To keep these camps going is murder to the children. It can never be wiped out of my memories of their people. It presses hardest on the children. They droop in a terrible heat and with the insufficient unsustainable food, whatever you do, whatever the authorities do, and they are, I believe, doing their best with the very limited means, it is all only a miserable patch on a great ill. Thousands physically unfit are placed in conditions of life which they have no strength to endure. In front of them is a blank ruin. If only the English people would try to exercise a little imagination, picture the whole miserable scene, entire villages rooted up and dumped in a strange bare place. The women are wonderful, they cry very little and never complain. The very magnitude of their sufferings, their indignities, loss and anxiety seems to lift beyond tears. Only when it cuts afresh at them through their children do their feelings flash out. Some people in town still assert that the camp is a haven of bliss. I was at the camp today and just in one little corner this is the sort of thing I found. The nurse underfed and underworked, just sinking into her bed, hardly able to hold herself up after coping with some 30 typhoid and other patients, with only the untrained help of two boor girls, cooking as well as nursing to do herself. Next tent, a six months baby, gasping its life out at on its mother's knee. Two or three others drooping sick in that tent. Next, a girl of 21 lay dying on a stretcher. The father Father, a big gentle boor kneeling beside her while next tent his wife is watching a child of six also dying at one of about five drooping. Already this couple had lost three children in the hospital and so would not let these go. Though I begged hard to take them out of the hot tent I can't describe what it is to see these children laying about in the state of collapse. It's just exactly like faded flowers thrown away and one has to stand and look on such misery and be able to do almost nothing. It was a splendid child and it dwindled to skin and bone. The baby had got so weak it was past recovery. We tried what we could but today it died. It was only three months but such a sweet little thing. It was still alive this morning. When I called in the afternoon they beckoned me to see the tiny thing laid out with a white flower in, a, in its wee hand. To me it seemed a murdered innocent and an hour or two after the child died another child had died in the night and I found all three corpses being photographed for the absent fathers to see some day. Two little wee white coffins at the gate waiting and a third wanted. I was glad to see them for at Springfontein a young woman had to be buried in a sack and it hurt their feelings woefully. It is such a curious position, hollow and rotten to the heart's core. To have made all over the state large uncomfortable communities of people whom you call refugees and say you are protecting but who call themselves prisoners of war compulsorily detained and detesting your protection they are tired of being told by officers that they are refugees under the kind and beneficent protection of the british in most cases there is no pretense that there was treachery or ammunition concealed or food given or anything. It was just an order was given to empty the country. Though the camps are called refugee, they are in reality very few of these. Perhaps only half a dozen in some camps. It is easy to tell them because they are put in the best marquees and have had time given to them to bring furniture and clothes and are mostly self-satisfied and vastly superior people. Very few, if any of them, are in want. Those who are suffering most keenly and who have lost most either of their children by death or their positions by fire and sword such as these reconcentrated women in these camps 
have the most conspicuous patience and never express a wish that their men should be the ones to give way. It must be fought out now, they think, to the bitter end. It is a very costly business upon which England has embarked, and even such a cost hardly the barest necessities can be provided, and no comforts. It is so strange to think that every tent contains a family, and every family is in trouble, lost behind, poverty in front, sickness, privation, and death in the present. But they are very good, and say they have agreed to be cheerful, and make the best of it all. The Mafeking camp folk were the very surprised to hear that English women cared a rap about them, or their suffering. It has done them a lot of good to hear that real sympathy is felt for them at home, and so I am glad I fought my way here, if only for that reason. This will be end of part one. If you made it this far, I really hope you're enjoying this channel. And if you'd like to support the creation of more content like this, because all contributions are greatly appreciated, please consider joining the channel in the membership tab or check out the Patreon link in the description below.